Uh, the recent reports of BBC portraits many selling their children, uh, selling their uh, kidneys uh, only to survive and put their kids uh, on bed with the sleeping pills. Uh, these reports are shocking and terrible. Uh, so, Ambassador, um, I would like to ask you to um, cover more closely the topic of inclusiv inclusivity and humanitarian aid to Afghanistan. Thank you. Um, first of all, a big thank you to the organizers for inviting inviting the European Union to, to this panel and, and myself. I'm extremely happy to be here, uh, such a diverse group of, of um, uh, diplomats, uh, leaders, academics, civil society activists and others, and I'm very privileged to, to be here. Um, and also very pleased to be, be part of this panel. My focus today uh, obviously will be on, on women in Afghanistan, and as EU Special Envoy for Afghanistan, it is a priority for me to engage as broadly as possible with Afghans. Often we talk about engagement and it's put in question because um, people think of engagement as speaking to the Taliban. I do speak to the Taliban, but it's a very small part of uh, the Af they are a small part of the Afghan population, very Afghans, and I spend most of my time speaking to other Afghans inside the country and outside the country. Uh, our political engagement is one element of our response or our effort to find a way forward. Our engagement is part of our uh, attempts to find a way forward in our, in our relations with the Afghan people and in our wish to remain engaged and support the Afghan people. The two other main parts is, and you referred to that, Ambassador, your introduction, the humanitarian needs, the economic uh, crisis, where we do provide substantial amounts of humanitarian assistance, around 300 million euros, uh, for humanitarian needs, not channeled through the Taliban, but through UN and, and other humanitarian partners. And we also channel uh, around 450 million euros for basic needs, meaning in this, uh, for education, um, health and, and livelihoods. And that includes, as a small part, but significant part of that also, uh, support for female uh, entrepreneurs in, in Afghanistan, which we see as part of, obviously, of the economy and of, of the future. So engagement, support, uh, but also uh, our presence on the ground. Were we fortunate enough to be able to be back uh, not everybody is. I understand security concerns, I understand political considerations, but our decision makers took uh, the decision uh, early this year that we could send a few diplomats back, not an ambassador, but a chargé d'affaires. And they took the decision even earlier than that, a month after um, August last year. We already had our humanitarian office with international staff open in Kabul. We are also fortunate enough that the leaders, the um, chargé d'affaires and the head of the humanitarian office are both women. They are not there because they are women, they are there because they were the best candidates, but we see it as an ad advantage and it offers for them and to us an opportunity also to speak directly to and what we need to do. But we have all seen the rapid and systematic deterioration in, uh, and an organized deterioration. It's not just a failure to uphold, it's systematically denying Afghan women of their rights. We talk a lot about education. It is fundamental, it's important, but it's all the other areas as well of economic life, political life, social life, uh, where women can, are not now even allow, allowed to go to, to parks. Um, and you know the situation much better than I do. Is this the West speaking to and dictating how Afghans should live their life? No. It is the West holding up or trying to uh, remind the Taliban that as de facto uh, authorities, as the de facto control over most of the territory in Afghanistan, they have an obligation to uphold the uh, obligations on human rights which uh, Afghanistan uh, have ratified. One example is, of course, the Convention against the, for the Elimination 
uh, Sodo Sido uh, back in um, 19, for the elimination of discrimination against women, signed in 1980 and ratified in 2003, if I'm not mistaken. The Taliban have a responsibility uh, to protect those rights. And we have seen documentation by UNAMA, by the UN Special Rapporteur Richard Bennett, that point to a very, very bleak development which I alluded to and which you are all very well aware of. Women's rights are not just an issue of international legal text. The fate of women and girls is paramount for the prosperity and future of Afghanistan. Women have played, do play and must play crucial roles in the economy, crucial from agricultural production to owning and running complex business operations and of course also in uh, the field of humanitarian work, um, NGOs and, and politics. They are crucial for maintaining basic services all across the country. The question I most often get is of course what, what to do about it. And the sobering reality I find is that change in, us, in Afghanistan essentially has to come from within the country. We can support in a modest way by being consistent, by being tough as some ask us to be, by being principled, by being pragmatic when we have to, but also, of course, Afghans outside the country, regional players and others with a genuine interest and commitment to Afghanistan can help. But um, at the end of the day, the driving force uh, must come from, uh, from within the country. We are limited in our presence, but we still have an important role to play in assisting and facilitating the voices of those fighting for the rights of women and girls. And I already referred to our minimal presence in Kabul, which we hear from Afghan women, from women in Kabul <laughs> essentially, but not only, that they feel safe, they feel listened to, and that it is one of the few places in Kabul where they can discuss some of the main concerns they have. Also internationally, we support the voice of Afghan women. We facilitate presence of a number of them, of you, uh, in important international events, such as the Human Rights Council in Geneva in September. Uh, we have facilitated, together with the EU Ambassador for Gender and Diversity, Ambassador Stella Ronner and myself, uh, the, uh, the organization of meetings of what we refer to, or what they refer to as the Afghan Women Leaders Forum uh, to facilitate the voices in international dialogue on Afghanistan. And I'm happy to see uh, that some of the participants in the forum uh, are present at this event. Our focus is not to speak on behalf of Afghan women. Afghan women are more than capable of speaking to themselves, provided they are allowed to, provided they are not uh, beaten, provided they are not prevented from doing so, and even when they are prevented or people try to prevent them from doing so, they stand up. And they stand up not only for the rights of women, which are crucial, of course. I see Afghan women today very much as defenders of other rights, of defenders of a future, and of um, those who can, and that the, their struggle uh, must uh, must also be seen as more than only, although that is important, of course, the rights of women. I will come back to, because my time is out, to a question of inclusivity, but I try to address that <coughs> to a question, provided you ask the right questions. Thank you. Uh, uh, Safir said, uh, Professor Qasem Shah Sikandar, جناب داکتر سیب مرادیان و تمام دستاندرکاران این برنامه و موقع به خاطر میزبانی بسیار خوبشان در یک کشوری که انوز درست معرفی نشده اما معلومدار اگر هر قدر عمیق برین در این کشور با ما اندازه به زیبایش پای میبریم با وجود که ما تقریبا 300 کیلومتر فاصله داریم من هم تازه به زیبایش در حال کشف کردن هستم تمام دوستایی که اینجا آمدن تشویق میکنم که این کشور با غنای فرهنگی که داره با دست نخوردگی هایی که داره ببینن و روزایی که اینجا هستن از او استفاده کنن تنکیو دس پانل مایت لک لک کاین اف سافت پاور فور می وومن ایشو از نو لانگر ا سافت ایشو 
it is a, a hardcore issue in Afghanistan. It is a, a hard power, I would say. Um, however, um, when we talk about women's rights, um, the first thing that comes to our mind is the progress women of Afghanistan have experienced in the last 20 years. Uh, while the women's struggle, their liberties, their movement, did not start from the last 20 years and it did not stop from the first round of Taliban when they were in power. In fact, in 1960s, way before I was born, or many of these women who are here, they were born, uh, we had female ministers. Um, I think uh, we had female ministers before some of our uh, neighboring and uh, friendly countries were um, e existed as a country even. But today we know that, uh, you know, um, Hena Rabanikar from one of our neighboring countries as a Muslim country is visiting Afghanistan, um, speaking and engaging with Taliban where uh, Muslim women in Afghanistan uh, cannot benefit their basic fundamental Islamic rights, let alone their human rights. So, um, uh, so it's a, it is a political issue, and it's for many of us it's rather also an emotional issue to see that decline, um, and 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 the fact that women are carrying the main burden of all of this. They are carrying the main burden of uh, of war and the so-called stability. Um, I would like to look at the two aspects of women's struggle in Afghanistan. Um, for many of us, women rights is just women rights. But for women of Afghanistan, it's beyond that. For women of Afghanistan, women rights is about their country's security and a global security. And it's about their country's economy. Um, when I say it's about their country's security, we all know that women have been used as a tool of war in the last four decades of war. As much as women have been used as a tool of war, the rest, the rest of the world has also not been safe and secure from Afghanistan. So women's rights is directly interconnected with global security. Just before the fall of Taliban, we knew that there are 20, uh, before the fall of Kabul, we knew that there are 22 military extremist groups operate between Afghanistan, Pakistan, Central Asia. Um, we know that they have all the opportunities to further <coughs> evolve their activities. If you don't believe that, just take a car and go 600 kilometers from Dushanbe towards Afghanistan borders, you will see all the signs of how, you know, women repression in Afghanistan have impacted Afghanistan security in terms of growth of military extremism, but also eventually, from my perspective, from all of our experience, it's going to impact the global security. So women's rights in Afghanistan is not just a simple rights to education or work. It's a very simpli simplified version of putting women's rights in that perspective. Depriving women from work in the last year impacted our economy, our country's economy, more than a billion dollars. Evidence shows that, and, and we're talking about a country that is in the you know, uh, age of uh, starvation, poverty. In that circumstances, 55% of the population are being pushed to the side from labor force, which of course impacted more than $1 billion to our economy. Now, I don't want to go to the figures of how many women are deprived of from school, education, etc. Because we all know these are repeated figures. But I would like to highlight the fact that what the women coping mechanisms have been inside Afghanistan. On the 17th of August last year, 2021, the first group of women protesters went to the street to ask for their rights. The number was small, but by doing so, the women actually challenged the Taliban's ideological hegemony of power, which was otherwise regarded as a holy power. We all know that in 1996, many people regarded Taliban as jihadis and holy power holder. Women of Afghanistan challenged that hegemony of power. We must not, now the number has grown up since then, as much as the numbers of women protesters chanting for education, work, freedom in Afghanistan has grown, we know that that much repressive measures by Taliban also increased. In fact, two weeks back, Zarifa Yaqubi and her friends were arrested from a press conference in Kabul. At 10 o'clock that day, she contacted me and say, she said she wants to prepare herself uh, uh, and her colleagues for a protest on the uh, eve of 25th of November, which is international um, two weeks of activism for violence against women. And my, my voice message to her was, are you sure you want to do it? 
And she was like, yes, yes, we want to do it. Consistent on what she was to do, she was delivering the message of her sisters across Afghanistan. Now, you might hear this justification from Taliban or their sympathizers sometimes that what we do is linked to culture. What we do is, of course, Islamic. From the woman's perspective in Afghanistan, it's neither of them. It's just Taliban's hegemony to remain in power. They see women, not only Taliban, most of these radicalized governments, dictators, they see women as a challenge to their power. And that's why the moment they give women freedom, they feel that they are like going to collapse like, you know, a snowball. When I was in Kabul and I was under house arrest, I had three Taliban in my gate. One day I went to see uh, President Karzai. So I had one of the Taliban guy accompanying me. And he was in the car, he was sharing his um, um, story, asking me question. He said, you know what, Ms. Kufi, in, in a beautiful Pashto language, and of course I was also speaking to him in Pashto, he said, you know what, Ms. Kufi, um, we were hearing that when in Kabul women are completely infidels. These are, of course, some of these Taliban that have no access to media. And we know that in Afghanistan, not everyone in the villages, in mountains, especially those who are fighting, have access to media. But when I came to Kabul, I see that it's not the same. You're wearing a scarf. Everybody else is wearing a scarf. Not probably the same way that the women in the villages do, because that is their tradition. Now that tradition also keeps changing. But you do wear a scarf. And he said, you know what, I, I want you to help me with a scholarship. Send me abroad. I don't want to work in, uh, be in Afghanistan. Now, after eight months of being in power, Taliban realized that they are losing power over their foot soldiers. Their own daughters being in, in best universities, best rank universities and schools, they repress women to keep their foot soldiers. Because that's how they keep their foot soldiers, by claiming the most conservative view of Islam which I don't even understand what kind of Islam is this. I mean, we have some religious scholars, I would be very happy if they help me understand within what context of Islam, women are not allowed to go to school. Because this is something we cannot, we cannot bring back. It's a gap that will never be felt. It's a gap that will never be felt by any means. I was a victim of Taliban's first round of power when they came, a victim of depriving from education. So they have started protesting in the streets. The number has grown, not to the extent that our brave sisters in Iran do, because civic activism doesn't have a long history in Afghanistan. But they did. They broke the silence. They broke the taboo. So therefore, what we did at the international level, we tried to amplify their voices. So we did in our own way. We, we resisted. We, we try to engage with the international community because there cannot be double standard. Because we cannot say women in Afghanistan deserve to be pushed to the corners of their homes while a woman in the rest of the world deserve all the liberties, right? We cannot have double standard. We cannot say that women in Qatar or Saudi Arabia could be more in school than male, but women in Afghanistan under the name of Islam could be deprived. So we engage with the international community. We engage with EU. We engage with um, with uh, other stakeholders, United Nations, others, to, to keep their attention on Afghanistan. I think in my engagement, I came to this uh, two, two uh, conclusion. The first conclusion is many people ask me, how do they influence Taliban? Now, I think influencing Taliban, there might be some Taliban who have their own daughters and female members of the family um, outside in the schools, university. I have visited some of the Taliban's family. I know their, their girls are in school. But are they able to challenge the power because their existence depends on that challenge? Can they do that? If they do that, welcome. Well, we will welcome that and we would like to influence that. But from my perspective, I think it's time for all of us to think of alternative. The moment you think of alternative, Taliban will start shaking because that's how we did. In, in 2011, when the Qatar office for Taliban started, the Afghan government started you know, getting weaker, 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 because they realized Taliban are the alternative. In that alternative, women should be the center, and the center for every change. I'm sorry to say, but my brothers, from the political community, from the elite community, 
from the streets of Kabul, they did not really stand in solidarity. So who deserves to be the center? It's the women of Afghanistan. And my plea to, to everybody who is engaged, our strategy has been to mobilize ourselves. We have mobilized. I think now the women movement in Afghanistan are the most mobilized. I'm not saying that we are 100% mobilized because it's not possible. Why do you expect us to be 100% mobilized? But we have mobilized ourselves to the extent possible. We have crossed ethnic lines. We have crossed all the differences we have in Afghanistan. Now, we want you to recognize us as a stakeholder. Give us that physical space that we are struggling for. It is not that we want to go follow your narrative. We have created our own narrative. Give, give us that space. Regard us as a stakeholder. Thank you. strategic studies for including me in this important Herat security dialogue and for including me specifically on this critical panel about Afghan women betrayal, apartheid, resistance. I sincerely wish that I could be with you in person today, but I'm honored to join the discussion virtually. In my time today, I will share my forthcoming paper, The International Obligation to Counter Gender Apartheid in Afghanistan. It will be published next week in the Columbia Human Rights Law Review. Short summary is already available on the website Just Security in English with a Farsi translation by Zubeda Akbar. To start, I will provide an overview of some of the main arguments and explain why I wrote this paper. My goal with this project was to find a way to enhance international responses to Taliban violations of the rights of Afghan women, to find international responses that are actually consonant with international law, and to ensure that the international community cannot simply walk away from its obligations to Afghan women simply by leaving the country. Given the lack of relevant standards on second state responsibility in international human rights law itself, I turn to the construct of gender apartheid as a means of achieving this goal. Now, the feminist case for responding to gender apartheid as apartheid was actually made the first time the Taliban took power in the 1990s. It was made by one lone UN expert, Abdul Fattah Amor, who you see here, a law professor from Tunisia, who was then the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief. And this case was also made by some women's rights advocates in Afghanistan and other Muslim-majority countries and around the world. However, the international legal case for recognizing gender apartheid as apartheid was not fully made, and that's what I'm trying to do in my paper. The point is to get the international community to adopt the gender apartheid approach this time, and thus be more effective in its response to the grave situation on the ground under Taliban rule. To achieve these objectives, my research draws both from the academic literature and also in a series of 16 interviews conducted remotely with Afghan women human rights defenders from September 2021 to February 2022. 
It was critical to me that Afghan women human rights defenders, or WHRDs, are not just objects of this research, but also participants in it, whose views help to inform the work. To review key aspects of the argument in the paper, I will address four questions it raises, time permitting. The first of these is, what is gender apartheid? Well, gender apartheid, as you see here, is a system of governance based on laws and or policies which imposes systematic segregation of women and men and may also systematically exclude women from public spaces and spheres. Discrimination itself becomes the governance model. Gender apartheid involves systemic oppression of women, defining women, as one of the interviewees told me, as being not as human as men. This mirrors the experience of black South Africans under the apartheid regime in that country. I turn now to the next question. How does the current situation in Taliban Afghanistan constitute gender apartheid? Well, the other speakers on this panel will address that issue in detail. I will simply say that today the Taliban have excluded women from most aspects of public life as they did in the 1990s. Just to focus on two of the restrictions, they have prohibited many women from working, and they have done so in the middle of a terrible humanitarian crisis in a country full of war widows. Meanwhile, they have banned girls above grade six from going to school and broken repeated promises to open those schools. They are, in fact, the only ruling group to have done this in the 21st century. Most recently, we know women have even been banned from public parks, literally being swept out of public space. Those who courageously oppose these policies, mostly Afghan WHRDs, have been terribly abused. A new global commitment to end gender apartheid in Afghanistan would be a way of supporting those who are risking everything to demand their universal human rights on the ground. Almost all of the Afghan women advocates I interviewed agreed with the characterization of the country's situation as gender apartheid mainly because they found this term to accurate, accurately reflect the way in which Taliban policy, quote, removes women from government and society, unquote. The women I interviewed also ratified this approach because they knew that the apartheid framework had been a key tool in improving the lived reality of black South Africans in the past. The UN response and international norms were, of course, only one component of anti-apartheid initiatives, but they contributed to the ultimate success of these efforts with the end of racial apartheid beginning in 1990. What I'm basically arguing is that international law should learn from its own successes. This brings me to question three, and you see this addressed on the slide here. If the situation in Afghanistan constitutes what I'm calling gender apartheid, what is the added value of the apartheid approach? So international law already has a robust paradigm for dealing with apartheid, developed primarily between the 1960s and 80s in response to the situation in Southern Africa and spurred by the dynamic commitments of decolonized states. It is explicitly drafted to respond only to racial apartheid and has not been formally used to address gender apartheid, as I argue it should be. Such a feminist transformation of international law to use Charlotte Bunch's concept, is essential in the 21st century and would be the most effective way to respond to Taliban Afghanistan 2.0. It is perhaps worth reminding ourselves how change was made in South Africa. International political will and local political struggle were essential catalysts for change and had a dynamic synergy. Newly decolonized states played a leadership role seeing the issue as a vital part of a larger struggle for decolonization and the achievement of self-determination. The African National Congress was even given observer status at the UN and carried out its own successful foreign policy. Highly publicized South African apartheid atrocities, such as the repression of the 1976 Soweto uprising, galvanized international opinion and action. The UN response and international norms were only one component of concerted, Global South-led anti-apartheid initiatives, but they created a powerful advocacy tool and helped mobilize global opprobrium for South African policy that, amongst other things, helped to break the deadlock on sanctions. 
As the academics David Walsh and J.E. Spence conclude in a review of the relevant external factors in a book called Ending Apartheid, it would be difficult to attempt a precise way for any one of the factors that basically contributed to the end of apartheid. It was rather their cumulative effect that did so. What can be asserted they continue with some confidence is that the changes that occurred in the norms governing state behavior were crucial. Western governments in particular had to pay at least some deference to these new norms, the effect of which was to give South Africa a unique status in the international society of states. And I think this is precisely what we have to try to do with Taliban Afghanistan, though the country situations and the times are indeed distinct. The most important of the racial apartheid standards was the International Convention on the Suppression and Punishment of the Crime of Apartheid, which came into force in 1976. The raison d'etre, the whole reason for this convention, was to maximize implementation capacity at the international level. This is precise, precisely what we need in the case of gender apartheid. The convention defines apartheid as, quote, inhuman acts committed for the purpose of establishing and maintaining domination by one racial group of persons over any other racial group of persons and systematically oppressing them, unquote. What I'm arguing is that if gender is substituted for race, this is an accurate reflection of Taliban policies vis-a-vis -vis women. The concept of apartheid should also be applied to other highly structured systems of control and oppression enacted by one group over another on the basis of discrimination, which is certainly the case in Taliban Afghanistan. Racial apartheid became not only unlawful, but also an international crime. While no one was ever actually prosecuted for this crime, as South Africa pursued a truth commission during its transition, the Apartheid Convention nonetheless provided a critical advocacy tool for opponents of apartheid. It was used as a standard for judging other countries' responses to South African behavior, and it was regularly cited in UN debates. The convention codified the view of the apartheid regime as an illegal situation to be ended. This is what we need with regard to Taliban rule in Afghanistan as well, really a rejection of so-called constructive engagement as the apartheid convention rejected uh, in engagement with racial apartheid in South Africa, demanding instead firm resistance. After the end of apartheid in South Africa, the 1998 Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court confirmed that apartheid continued to be a crime and to rise to the level of a crime against humanity. The International Law Commission in 2001 recognized anti-apartheid norms as use kogans, the highest level norms in international law. And my paper argues in favor of employing such a vigorous approach to confronting the equally heinous practice of using discrimination against women as a governance model, as in Afghanistan currently. This, I argue, can both empower and require rights respecting responses from other states and from an international community which claims to value these human rights. International pronouncements in favor of equality without appropriate action, discredit the Women's Human Rights Project. This impact is magnified as a number of states and international organizations are actually now sort of participating in gender apartheid by sending all male delegations to Kabul. And as some states actually move towards normalizing relations with the Taliban, or even to promoting or supporting them internationally, as is the case with just a few governments, like China, Pakistan, and Russia. So to return to this question of the added value, the apartheid model here offers a factually accurate description of the situation, but also one that carries the appropriate stigma. And it also can offer an essential mechanism for generating at least some global legal accountability for this transnationally created disaster of the Taliban's return to power. In the words of one of those I interviewed, Shahrazad Akbar, it can be a, quote, powerful mobilizing tool. The symbolic and expressive importance of applying the apartheid concept to a fact pattern like Taliban Afghanistan enhances what we call the mobilization of shame, which is a critical international law compliance tool. 
and it does so more effectively than using other terms like discrimination or even systematic discrimination alone. Those terms are just not strong enough to characterize the situation in Afghanistan now. And I think using the apartheid framing can put pressure on governments, international organizations, and even transnational corporations not to engage with the Taliban in ways that show tolerance for and help to perpetuate grave abuses. Using the term apartheid also makes clear the pariah status of the perpetrators. It elevates the status of the practice's local opponents. Conversely, a failure to employ this heightened concept and enhanced response to a regime whose well-known policies are this relentlessly anti-women sends a terrible message, first to Afghan women, but secondly to women all across the region, and finally to women everywhere, that their rights do not matter. I would argue that understanding the Taliban as perpetrators of apartheid, a grave international crime, could have a number of direct consequences by shaping and constraining the policy choices of other actors. And I'll just mention a few examples briefly. The group's leadership is already featured on UN Security Council sanctions lists, but it must remain so. And I think recognition of Taliban policies as apartheid can help to ensure this outcome over time. The Taliban remain unrecognized at the UN and cannot take the seat of Afghanistan there. This too must continue to be the case as long as its gross human rights violations persist. Given the South African precedent where apartheid South Africa was ultimately ejected from the General Assembly, this result is more likely if the de facto authorities in Afghanistan are today understood to practice the international crime of apartheid also. And those states inching towards recognition could be more vigorously dissuaded. Those states that seek to normalize relations with the Taliban could find themselves scrutinized for complicity with apartheid. Given the current dire situation, there is no other way to achieve progress on human rights than to concert the efforts of the international community and to do so within the framework of global obligations to combat apartheid. As Horia Mossadegh, who I interviewed for the paper as well, told me, quote, the Taliban are known for being a gender apartheid group and there is no space in the 21st century for any form of gender apartheid, for any form of apartheid including gender apartheid. Informed by her words and those of her fellow Afghan women's rights advocates, we need a renewed international effort to support Afghan women human rights defenders in realizing the end of Taliban apartheid. Thanks for listening and I wish you the very best for a successful panel and conference.
زنان در این کشور از حقوق اساسی و ابتدایی خود محروم شدند. آنها اجازه آمستر رفتن حق کار و حتی حق سفر بدون محرم را ندارند. زنان زیاد شکنجه، گرباران و محروم سفرانی شدند. متاسفانه این روز بعد از بیشتر از دو دقه تحریف اطراف می شود و ما شبیدی ناتوان و آجیزی افرداری دیگوزیتی در زندگی زنان در طول پیش از چهار در جنگ در افغانستان عشق مادران و زنان این کشور کشکیده است نهرکشان در گلو در مونده است و چهایشان سفسان و سرگردان در هر گوشه دنیا هستند و چهایشان را هر دو مسلمان در بازار می کنند اینجا است که قصه هندوستان از شایی صورت پرور تاجی مرزا دوستان را نبود که هنوز کودر بودم در دفنیستان و آمده بودم و خاطر می رسد. کودر که می گرشت با دوتی بود در خیابان لبی بردی و این قیصه بسیار روز بود که هنوز از تیفلی و من نام یا خوبستان را باشیم آسان و سیفانه با گذشتی چار دهه از این هنوز هم زنی را خوبستان زرج می کشد. سوال من از مردان این دنیادار این است. اما تا قید باید این محکومیت را زنی افغانستان تحمل کنند. اگر از این اطلاق جای بود آب ما خاموشی و به توجهی دنیا را از ایمان جنرات کرونا علیه زنان و کودکان افغانستان خیلی با به تحمل شدند. دنیا خصوصا را و متاسیفانه برکه کشورهای منطقه نه تنها حمایتی از زنان نمی کنند بلکه در آورده چونی روزگار سیر به سر زنان افغانستانی تخیل می کنند حمایت از زنان افغانستان افغانستانی باید در دستور کار دولتهای جهان برخصوص همسای کشورها قرار بشه باشد مقاومت زنان برای بعد از آورده جمهور اساسی شد زندگی در داشتن زبان و فرهنگشان و بقای این رسلشان قابل تحسین و قولی کننده است. حضور زنان افغانستان در شست این روز نشان میگرد که زرکیت زنان در رسطه های رحمتی و سیاسی و قولی رسیده است. از فرضیه کفی بوزی سابق پاکرمان افغانستان منیجه باقتری سفیر افغانستان در قولین و نیست زنان تا احساس جوده های خونی و بول برابر مردان برای حل مشکل افغانستان این روز خواستی مردان بشن یون خیانت تاریخی از رویی مردان و قدرت های دخیل در بازی تکرام شود ما زمان تاجیک این روز با شرافت سیاست متبیرانه پشکای تاجیکان جناب یادی امامالی رحمان از همه خوبه های دیمکرتی برخوردار می باشیم و در کنار زمان افغانستان قرار درست همچنان رئیس جمهوری مخترم ما از این مردهای بلندی و نمیلگی همیشه و صبحات افغانستان همسایه نزدیک ما تحکیل می بردن ما زمان آزاده توجیب نیست خواستان رسیدن حق و حقدار و با رستن زمان همسایه خود هستیم. در سنزاده سود و بر ما فکرد زن اگر آتش نمی شد خام می بوده ما نارسیده بوده در جام می بوده ما از این جنبازی های نربنه شما زنانی نه تنها افغانستان بلکه زنان آباه دنیا به صدوق آمدند نیست با جنگ زنده و زن
which will end up with a number of individuals. I respect that in some countries quotas may be necessary. I don't personally necessarily see that as, as a useful model, but that's for Afghans to decide on. What we have underlined from a European point of view is indeed that it is a process where each and every adult, at least, Afghan man and woman, have a say. Uh, we are used uh, in Europe to say that this is best ensured through uh, elections. I know that Afghans have different experiences of elections uh, and I don't see it happening tomorrow. Uh, but it is indeed about a way in which voices can be heard and all voices can be heard in some form of structured way and the result of that will then be, be, be respected. Um, we, as part of that, obviously, it's a matter of involving Pashtuns, Tajiks, Uzbeks, men, also to, to men and to border groups. Thank you. A forum that we can attend or create to make sure your voice is heard. And Sarah, I'm sorry if you don't like the tweets that show solidarity with the Afghan people uh, or express grief at what is happening to you. But I have to say, I do not think Twitter is a place where high-level diplomacy takes place takes part. So I talked to the Taliban, and I talked to the Taliban about Afghan women and about the people of Afghanistan. And I put human rights in a security context, as Thomas has talked about, that the Taliban is in trouble uh, if they think a government that does not reflect the diversity of the country is a government that can stand. Because you are you look around this table and you see all kinds of Afghans uh, and you are all important and you all contribute. Uh, and, and when we talk to the Taliban about being a responsible member of the international community, if that is in fact their uh, objective, uh, we talk about human rights not being something you do because it is right, but because it is in your interest. And it is in their interest to make sure Afghans uh, are, feel represented and do not feel disenfranchised. There are plenty of organizations in Afghanistan uh, that will take advantage of Afghans who do not feel part of the, uh, part of the body politic. I don't put that on Twitter, but I assure you, Sarah, it is a conversation we have. Thanks very much. <laughs> خیلی خوشحالم تشکر ما بحث از اونجا میکنیم که خانم کوفی اشاره کردن به همکار خود خانم ظریفه یعقوبی و از همکارانشان و اینا در حدود 20 روز است که اینا دستگیر شدن و سرنویش هم معلوم نیست و ما متاسفانه خبرهای خیلی بدی در خصوص تعرض و حتی تجاوز به زنان افغانستان دختران افغانستان هر روز ما میشنیم یعنی اینا مستند و دروغ هم نیست خصوصا طالبا یک رویش که گرفتن نیست که در خیابان زنانی رو که اونجا اعتراض میکنن اونا رو شناسایی میکنن بعد بر یک فرصت دیگه اونا رو دستگیر میکنن میبرن و ما بسیار نگران از اونا هم هستیم و رد میگیرن یعنی کل مردم افغانستان زیر تحت ستم و تحت تجاوز و ظلم و برهمی هستند اما زنان در حقشان ظلم و مضاعف صورت میگیرند و شما شاهد صحنه های بسیار دلخراش هم هستید آخرین جنایتی که در حق دختران انجام شد این مسئله کاج بود دخترایی که میرفتن اونجا درس میخوندن 
و در اونجا یک خواجه بسیار عظیم صورت گرفتن که عمدتا از مردم هزاره بود همونطور که آقای میکلسون سرگو مشاره کردن و اینا در اونجا قتل عام شد و یک جنایت بشری بود البته در زمان جمهوریت هم ما چنین قتل عام هایی در مورد زنان که در بیمارستان بود و در حال بلادت اطفالشان و همونطور دخترانی که در مدارس بودیم کشتارها رو ما داشتیم ولی مسئله خوبی که این بود اینه که در زمان جمهوریت ما شرایط بهتر برای زنان ما بود یعنی یکی از خوبی های جمهوریت همی بود که در زنان در اونجا آزادی داشتن ما قبول داریم که جمهوریت ما در افغانستان در جناب سفیر سایق به ناطقی چون وقت کم است اگر ممکن باشه شما پرسش تانم مفرق یک دقیقی دیگه پرسش تانم آه مرد دیم یک دقیق ما را حل کنیم و مخصوصا مسئله زنان را و در این قسمت نقش جامعه جهانی نقش آمریکا و اروپا کشورهای منطقه بسیار مهمه گرچه ما در صحبت قبل از زورم عرض کردم که کشورهای منطقه و جامعه جهانی هم مشکلات دارن اختلافات دارن و اینا هم باید در مسئله افغانستان یک دست یک پرچه باشن تشکرشون سلامت ممنون شما همکارم از ایران صحبت میکنن نمیخوام من این سوال بگوشم نمیخوام که بحث رو زیاد بکشن به یک دفعه دیگه ولی شما پکتی بین خواهیم باختری که حرکت زنها رو چطور میتونیم به یک ب... حرکت بین دورمنانی تبدیل کنیم من به این فکر که الان این روز خوب بخوانم بانان یک ایرانی هستن در فرانسی زندگی میکنم این حرکتی که در ایران شروع شده به نام زیر عنوان زن زندگی و آزادی در اصل مولان یک حرکت زنان شروع شد ولی موضوع رو خیلی گست کرده تر کردن گفتن از برداشتن گشت ارشاد روسری اجباری تا مرگ بر دکتاتور جمهور اسلامی یعنی خیلی سیاسیش کردن گسترده شده خشونت هست در آیا این راه به نظر ما درسته یا نه این الگویه میخواستم بپرسم از خانم کوفی آیا با این نهزت زنها در ایران شما مثلا رابطه دارین یا فکرتون روی این راهی که در ایران دنبال میشه چیه یا به طرف ترکستان یا گرز از افغانستان در کنات گو تو سکوت وی من از افغانستان هو یوز تو گو تو ورک پیسیس در کنات گو تو سکوت ام سو سوری America doesn't like Afghanistan. Your president always says that he doesn't like Afghanistan. And you're pushing, pushing every single time that please look at us, we exist. Your president doesn't like us, so they don't care about us. What, what? A girl who grew up during the past 20 years. You didn't live in Afghanistan. I lived in Afghanistan. I traveled to many provinces of Afghanistan. You know what does it mean? In patriarchal society, in very anti-woman society, a girl decides to go to school, a girl decides to go to university, a girl decides to work among men. You know what does it mean? It is courage, and we had it. We are not any more subject of, pro, uh, of proposals or, or mid-term or long-term or short-term of projects. We are so much tired of personal PR of some our women activists too. Women of Afghanistan, they know now how to articulate their thoughts. The generation of Afghanistan, they know how to articulate their thinking. But today, shamely, shamely UNICEF creating course for women of our, girls of Afghanistan how to make a bread. We know our mothers know better. We don't know somebody come from United uh, States or from uh, London to teach us that how to, play, uh, to bake a uh, bread. The narrative about Afghanistan, we are not beggars. We are, we were and we, we are very active participants of, of development of, of our country. These people are, who are there sitting, they are 
generation that they re really put their, their, uh, their life and we follow, we follow them. So please, we are not any more naive. It is not about Twitter. It is not about social media. It is about reality of Afghanistan. More than 400 days, the uh, uh, girls of Afghanistan cannot go to school. I was searching for piece of body of my employee in Afghanistan when Taliban killed them. You don't know what does it mean. So please do, it is not just you, you mean US, okay? Please do not convince us that our killers have changed. But we are still ready to negotiate with them. We are still ready to talk with them. Because we want to live in our country. Because we want to build our country. Because we love Afghanistan. Because Afghanistan is not for us project. Afghanistan is our motherland. Afghanistan is peace, peace of Afghanistan, are full of promising. What I should do with the group photo? What it gives to me? What I should do with dinner with some exclusive people? It is good for some leaders that they have NGOs. But for generation of Afghanistan, we need peaceful, free Afghanistan to return to our country and to be active participant of development of our motherland. This is what we need. Uh, dear Sarah if, Karimi, I really don't yeah, want to if, stop if, you. If you, as a United States, as a powerful country, can help us, then please help us. If you cannot help us, then please do, do not give us promise, because you break the promise that you gave us 20 years ago. I'm so sorry to be so direct, but I need to be, because people are here, they just compromise us. And there are two women, Henara Bonikar, and another woman that I don't know. I just tweeted that uh, this is called hypocrisy and dishonesty. The Taliban have systematically removed Afghan women from public domain, but when it comes to their interest, they have no issue sitting with a female official across one table. Expecting for the Taliban to recognize and to allow Afghan women to come back to their normal life is, I think, a false expectation from the Taliban. Secondly, I have uh, some questions uh, from Khanum Kufi and uh, Ambassador Nicholson. First of all, thank you, uh, Khanum Kufi, for being the frontliner of, of this movement for your hard work. Uh, you are a hero for us, for the uh, Afghan woman. Um, it's been almost two years that the um, Afghan uh, children, women, cannot go to school. And it's going to stay like this probably as long as the Taliban will be in power. So as a, as a long-term solution for, for the issue of education, have you talked with the uh, international community about building some sort of online education system for Afghan women. Because I feel and I think that in the very short term, Afghanistan will have uh, a big percentage of illiterate women. And we know that how bad that will be for our society, for our families, for the future of Afghanistan. Ambassador Nicholson, um, we have leaked a, 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 a news from Kandahar that the Supreme Leader, the uh, Ayatollah, have signed a decree banning all education for Afghan women starting just at the end of this school year. What's your information? Thank you. One is the man of Afghanistan. It's questioning our hypocrisy of claiming the, the, to be protectors of women, what we have failed to do. We live in a crisis of masculinity that has never been faced by Afghan man. 
We are ashamed of ourselves for not having been able to stand on the streets in support of our sisters, our mothers, and our uh, daughters. The second major hypocrisy is the international community's hypocrisy. And this should not be taken lightly because Hippocratic approach does not help build peace. It never has, it never will. We really need to, in the case of the situation in Afghanistan, overcome these Hippocratic stance. First, us, the man of Afghanistan, should remove the shame that is upon our shoulders. And secondly, I beg the international community to stop being hypocritical. Thank you very much. ما فکر میکنم بعد از شکلگیری اعتراضات زنان ایران در داخل افغانستان هم شما دیدین که به حمایت زنان ایران اعتراضات شد ما فکر میکنم تعداد زیاده از مردم در داخل افغانستان انگیزه گرفتن حال اگر این اعتراضات در داخل ایران به هر جای برسه نرسه لاقل منتج به بعض اصلاحات خواهد شد و این حداقل است که شاید مردم در ایران انتظار داشته باشن و در داخل افغانستان تعداد زیاد زنها انگیزه گرفتن و فقط انتظار دارم که برادرای ما مامی انگیزه را بگیرن که در کنار زنای استاد چون هرچند سختتر از در افغانستان ولی خوب مبارزه با آسانی با پیروزی نمیرسن دو سه موضوع دیگه در مورد چیزی که جناب سنجر صاحب گفتن آنلاین ادویکیشن وی ار اول تراینگ تو سی اف اور گرلز گو تو ریگولر اسکول because nothing actually replaces online education, uh, actual education, regular education. Online education is an alternative, but it is not, uh, you know, what we should actually alternate for our regular school system, because this is something we should um, all push, and we should all hold Taliban accountable for, because they are denying an Islamic rights of women. Not only a human rights principle, but an Islamic rights of women. And they are doing so because they don't want the society to be aware of their rights. They are afraid of an educated society. Two more issues. For me, inclu inclusivity is no longer um, developing a list of individuals to be part of a government and including two women. For me, from now on, inclusivity means women take the charge and include men in that list. A woman-centric narrative, honestly. Some of you smile because it looks very strange. But we are trying for that. That is our, our struggle. Because without that, things will not change. You have to start from a radical change in order to, to, to go to minimal uh, expectations. Moving forward, I think, I think we have to really work around the political ecosystem. If we don't change the ecosystem of Afghanistan, the political ecosystem, only focusing on girls' education or women's rights is not going to be impactful. We have to change the political ecosystem. And for that, we all need to put our efforts together for an alternative. I know that there are a lot of questions about everybody, including those who are not in Afghanistan. But let's not forget that Taliban were not in Afghanistan for 20 years. They were still regarded, they were not regarded as diaspora. They were not regarded as leaders in exile. We didn't choose to leave our home. So there are a lot of efforts to discredit those voices who are outside the country and divide women between women and inside and outside. It's true that we are not physically inside the country, but it, there is no day and, and time that we are not engaged with our sisters. In fact, now we have started to make that engagement more systematic. Last, last engagement was, um, you know, people went to Kandahar, people went to Kabul in your offices, people went to... Um, uh, not only in Kabul, but people went to different offices in Afghanistan for, to consult with us, to share their problems. But we don't need to listen to them to know what, what is the problem in our country. We listen to them because we want to give them importance, because we want them to feel that they are listened to, not because we are not aware of what's happening in our country. And so therefore, I think these efforts to divide women and the society between in, inside and outside and exile and diaspora I don't really entertain that argument, because if that was an, an argument that was supposed to be entertained, Taliban are by no means legitimate to represent the people of Afghanistan, because their leader is a mysterious leader. We don't even know if he exists. 
There was the claim in the morning that one ambassador met him. Yes, I know. We don't know he really met uh, Mullah Haibatullah, if he's the same person that actually talks. So if we regard somebody who is mysterious as a leader, why not women of Afghanistan as stakeholders? Thank you. And that is ready to listen, or that it will be more convinced by us speaking out uh, now than, than afterwards. That's a debate we can have, and I'm, I'm happy to have it also bilaterally, and you may have different views in the, in the room about that. Secondly, if there is a further, uh, um, such a dramatic decision would be taken or put in practice even without formally being announced, it would of course be devastating and it would further, further underline uh, many of the challenges we have talked about today. It would further, I think, uh, and I hope in that case, put the Taliban in a position where it would be, even in the medium term, increasingly more difficult for them to find any kind of support or substantial support inside the country. It's an issue, uh, education is an issue where the international community, for those who like the term and do not like the term, is really very, very much united. There are other issues when it comes to Taliban policies where there are, there are more differences, but this is the one where everybody uh, basically has spoken up where, and I would in that case also look forward to responses um, and to work together with the neighbors of uh, Afghanistan, uh, Muslim majority countries in other parts of the world, EOIC, and it's not to shift again the responsibility to others, but it's to build on a common position that we actually have on this, have on this issue and to counter the narrative, if ever that narrative would be based on the Taliban interpretation of Islam. And finally, and that comes back to the first question, I agree on, in principle, uh, informal, uh, online, uh, secret schools, uh, radio stations, it's not what we want to see, but if we have the choice between offering girls some kind of education of reasonable quality through bridging measures rather than not doing it, in the hope that this will not be a long-term solu solution, which it will not be, or doing nothing and hoping for the political system to change uh, to allow formal education for all girls. My personal preference would still be to go for the first, but again, if that is not required, requested, wished by Afghans, of course we will not in any way uh, step in. No, I just wanted to correct myself. I didn't mean that I'm completely against any kind of alternative. What I'm saying is that by giving alternative online education or home-based school or private uh, school or personal uh, schools, we should not really put all our focus on this, forgetting the formal school system. That's what I meant. Uh, I would like to thank you for uh, being with us today and for sharing your points of view. Thank you everyone, and I'm sorry that I took uh, some minutes of your break.